go ahead and start because all the important people are here. <laughs> and at home, is anybody at home? Oh yeah, we've got Dave Clark, Claudia West. Yay, nice. Okay, so um, I think everybody knows me. I'm gonna talk today about tools for managing anxiety. And this is kind of a, a follow-up of the talk that I gave last month where I talked in general about anxiety and we discussed a few things, but um, different people approached me afterward and, and maybe wanted some more specific tools for anxiety. So I'm gonna start with just a quick review of what was on my lecture last month. I'm gonna whip through these initial slides kind of quickly because I wanna to get to the tools part. But ask questions as we go along if you have any questions. So just to review, what is anxiety? What do you guys think of when you think of anxiety? Without looking up there. <laughs> you can cheat and look up there. But just for yourself, what do you think of for yourself? Discomfort, that's a good one. Nervousness. Feeling like you don't have control. Yeah. Yeah. Shallower. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Those are some of the symptoms we have. We might not even know we're anxious until we notice our breathing or our chest feels a little bit, you know, squeezy, tight. So anxiety, uh, is a, is a generalized feeling. It's kind of an overall feeling. Sometimes we can't say what it's from. We just have, like you guys have said, an uncomfortable, uneasy uh, feeling. Um, but if we are able to think about it, if we're able to identify our thoughts, it's, uh, it's future oriented. It's what we're worrying about that might happen. It's not what's happening you know, right in the moment. Uh, it's driven by, of course, the what ifs. What if this happens? What if you know, I go to give a lecture to the participants today at the cardiovascular wellness program and I get my brain goes into a fog and I can't speak, you know, all those what ifs. I didn't have that thought. I had other thoughts, but not that one. Um, so a lot of the what ifs and being aware of the what ifs, all of this has to do and you'll you'll get this in your brain as we go along, but realizing what you're thinking, you know, what's in your brain that's creating the anxiety. And as you guys talked about, it's characterized by feelings of tension, worried thoughts, phys sometimes physical changes such as breathing, um, feeling cold. It's normal to have a little bit of anxiety every day, right? If we didn't have a little bit of anxiety, we wouldn't be able to kind of get through our day. We have to be able to be thinking about the future a little bit. So it helps us to prepare with situations that might be coming up. You probably just coming here, you were all thinking, oh, the traffic, you know, I'm going to have to deal with that traffic and they're still doing that construction on blah, blah, blah. So it's helping you kind of with your planning and uh, moving forward. It motivates you to move toward your goals. Problematic anxiety may occur when we overestimate a problem. We do, and we all do that a lot. And this is what we really do, underestimate our ability to deal with it. Mm -hmm. So... Right, so imagine we're doing that all the time. No wonder we're, you know, feeling anxious. So, yes. So it's not just that last thing you said. So it's not just regular anxiety, it's, it's a problematic anxiety. So it's more specific. Well, that's a good question. Um, general anxiety is just a general feeling and sometimes you don't even know what it's from. You can also have a problematic anxiety where there's a problem, the, the that you're thinking about and ruminating about the the thing the thing that makes it a problem is good lead into this next slide is when it persists over time so there could be a problem that's really specific but you try to deal with it and you're not able to and it just goes on and on and on and you're not able to come up with a solution it's just kind of hanging over you then eventually you end up with kind of this you're walking around all the time with kind of this uneasy feeling right so good question. So anxiety becomes a problem in our life when it persists over time, when it uh, when it causes unhappiness or distress and the way that one feels. So instead of you know walking around relaxed, you're feeling more uneasy, uh, maybe more sad. When it interferes with normal functioning, 
at school, at work, in our relationships. It can get in the way of all those things and our ability to enjoy leisure activities. So you guys have already mentioned some symptoms of anxiety. Here's, here's a list and there's more. Feeling restless, noticing that we're ruminating or overthinking, not just one thing, but a lot of things. We just get stuck in our brains with it. Difficulty concentrating sometimes. Here's a big one, feeling more irritable. You know, you're annoyed if somebody cuts in line in front of you when normally you'd be like, oh, you know, they're having a rough day, but it makes you irritable. Feeling more tired, noticing a change in your eating habits, maybe eating, under eating or overeating. Difficulty sleeping, difficulty in our relationships and work, decreased ability to enjoy life. And we're all different, right? So we're all gonna have different ways that we exhibit or that we feel when we have anxiety. Anxiety can lead to, the reason we don't wanna continue with anxiety is it can lead to unhelpful behavior change, right? What are some unhelpful ways that we deal with anxiety sometimes? Acting out in anger, right? That gets in the way of us really having relationships at work and with our family members. Other? Overeating. Overeating. Alcohol consumption, yeah. Isolating. <laughs> Isolating, yeah, big one, yeah. Go out. That's right, isolating, yeah, it's a big one. Let it invade our sleep patterns. Not sleeping, yeah. Or getting up in the middle of the night and looking at your phone. Right, numbing, numbing ourselves yeah. with with activities. Why do we know all the, the bad things? That we, <laughs> I I you, their life's like this. <laughs> oh, I know that one. I know that one. <laughs> <Of> experience. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah. So we know all that. And the reason for that is that I'm going to mention this in the upcoming slides, is that when we, we develop bad habits as a way to deal with anxiety, uh, and the ways that I say bad, I'm not trying to label it. It's just they're unhelpful unhelpful habits that help us get us through, but they don't really help with the anxiety for very long. Sometimes short-term they help. Is it, is it, is it a the habits are learned. Yes, we learn. Yeah. Because it maybe worked a little bit in one situation at one time, but it's not working in this situation or it's not working for long-term relief from the anxiety or from the problem. So you're talking about the anxiety we're going to talk about where anxiety comes from you think i i he's asking all the right questions did you read my powerpoint before because okay so in the long run anxiety contribute to all sorts of health issues uh, arthritis chronic pain heart disease stroke hypertension asthma gi issues and migraines have all been documented and yeah, and uh, substance abuse. So prevalence, 40 million Americans, 19.1% of us have some form of anxiety. Uh, the majority have a mild in impairment. These are the different, so that's a high, almost 20% of us, right? Have an anxiety problem. I don't know. Why, why are they saying 40 million Americans then? I don't know. They said it was 19.1%. Oh, well, so be... Close. So these are different. You might hear anxiety called different things. I'm not going to go through all these. These are just different labels that we can put on, on anxiety. Um, the most common is a generalized anxiety disorder. And on the next slide, I actually, uh, this is a, it's called a GAD-7, General Anxiety Disorder 7, and this is what they use in hospitals and clinics to uh, measure if people are having anxiety. And it's very common. Some of you may have taken this when you've gone to the clinic. They measure, they screen for anxiety and depression now in many of the clinics. This is a nice little um, uh, test to take for yourself. It kind of categorizes it, whether you're having mild anxiety, uh, moderate or severe anxiety. It's quick, quick, easy tests to take. They do that, yeah. So tools to better manage anxiety. 
Um, this is what I wanna spend some time talking about today. There's a lot of tools to manage anxiety and I put them all up here because different things work for different people and it should try, you should try different things because you don't really know what's gonna work until you try it. Today, I'm gonna to focus on cognitive restructuring, kind of thought challenging self-talk that we do and also a little bit on meditation. But you can see all these different things help and most of these things we offer here, right? We offer, um, uh, like today, you're learning about anxiety and tools that you can use. Linda Larson teaches a meditation mindfulness class once a month. Um, there have been times when different students have talked about journaling and uh, offered a journaling um, process as part of the program here. We have mind games and puzzles. Exercise is a big component. Um, we don't have graded exposure here. That's where you, if there's something you're anxious about, you do it little bits of at a time until you can get used to it and your mind realizes, oh, I'm not gonna die from this. I'm okay, I can do a little bit more. Um, music and hobbies, getting appropriate sleep and creating social support and connection. Lots of times you come here and if you've been ruminating about something and you start talking to somebody, you get a whole new perspective or at least you get people that are supportive of you and you don't feel so alone with it. So I'm gonna spend some time talking about the cognitive behavioral model. Has anybody heard of that? CBT? It's by a, a researcher and a therapist, a PhD named Aaron Beck. Came out in the 1960s, it's very popular. And uh, although you may not heard it called this, once I start talking about it, you'll probably recognize uh, the model. So basically what it comes down to is a situation happens to you. Um, and because of that situation, you have automatic thoughts that you don't even, re you don't know where they came from. You just start thinking that. And those thoughts, we don't do a behavior or have a reaction without having a thought, right? So there's always thoughts that come before our behavior. Many times they're, they're just automatic and we don't even know we're having them. But somehow, you know, we come home from work, we've had a hard day. Before you know it, we're standing in front of the cupboard eating, you know, nuts. So how did, <laughs> I've never done that personally, but I've, <laughs> I've heard that other people have done that. So, <laughs> so, but there's some sort of automatic thought we're having that, oh, I'm gonna feel calmer if I go and eat some nuts right now. I'm, I deserve this, I'm tired, blah, 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 blah. There's some sort of automatic thought. So we need to be a, start to be aware of our thoughts because our thoughts create our behavior. And our thoughts and our behavior then become habits. We, we don't even think. We come in the front door after work, we just go straight to the cupboard or you know whatever it is we do, go straight for the wine bottle, whatever it is. Um, so it's important to be aware of the thoughts we're having because those create our behaviors. So um, this breaks it down a little bit more. There's something called the cognitive behavioral triangle. And the idea of this that the, is that your thoughts your emotions and your behavior all kind of work together. And uh, sometimes you can, the one of the easiest places to intervene is right at the thoughts, but you can also intervene uh, at your emotions. So if you notice that you're feeling anxious all the time, it's caused from a thought you're having, but you can go right to the emotion and work on just doing some meditation, some relaxation techniques, those kind of things to just change the emotion. Um, the behavior, you know, uh, sometimes you're here and somehow, you know, you think you're going to come and just listen to a lecture, but somehow somebody leads you over and you end up working out on the treadmill. So sometimes you just do it, you know, you change your behavior. And then that changes. Once you've changed your behavior, that changes your thoughts. It changes your emotions. You see how they all kind of work together. So let's kind of go through this. So um, uh, I'll give an example of like today. So for myself, so um as I was, you know, getting ready to give the lecture, I was having some thoughts um, about how I was feeling about giving the lecture, and I was a little bit nervous about it. I had a little bit of anxiety, so I first noticed the anxiety before I noticed my thoughts. By the way, I noticed I had a little bit of nervousness about giving the lecture, and uh, then Leanne asked me. She said, "Are you nervous for the lecture today?" And I said, "Yeah, yeah I'm a little bit nervous," and. Um, and I thought, and then I thought, well, what are my thoughts that I'm, I'm not nervous for no good reason. There's some thought I'm having, right? Something came before the feeling. And um, 
So the thoughts that I was having were, were that, well, this is the first time I'm giving this actual lecture. Uh, sometimes, you know, the first time you give a lecture doesn't go that well. And I was worried that people, that I might know all the information, but that I wouldn't present it well and that you, and people wouldn't get anything from the lecture, you know, it'd be kind of a waste of time. And so then I, I thought, well, is that true? Is that a true thought? And I thought, well, you know, I've never given a lecture and had nobody get anything from it. So unlikely that that's going to happen. Right. And then I thought to myself, what really helped me let go of my anxiety was that all I want is people to get maybe one thing from the lecture, one little seed that they utilize in some way. And that's really, and that is true. So when you're thinking about how to change your thoughts, you wanna change your negative thoughts that aren't true and aren't helpful to something that is true. You don't wanna just stick some thought in your head that's not true. You don't wanna say, well, Sharon, you're the greatest lecturer ever. People like come from all over the world to see you. And you know, that's not true. And it's not helpful, you know? I mean, to think that it makes me more anxious because it's not true, you know, but to think, you know, I really just want everybody to get one little seed. It, it is true, you know, and it, and it helps. So when you think of a thought that is true and helpful and, um, and supportive of you, that's the thought to have in your head. It's got to be true. And you can have that thought at the same time that you're thinking, you know, well, it's the first time I've given this lecture, but at the same time, well, you know, the new thoughts. Thank you. You got one little seed there, didn't you? <laughs> so when I have that thought, my emotions are, I, I really, I don't have much anxiety. I'm not worried about it. And so then my behavior is, I'm hoping right now I'm speaking clearly and that you are able to understand what I'm saying. But if I would have kept that original thought in my head and ruminated on and been ruminating on it for a couple of days, that the first time I've given this lecture, I know in the past when I've given a lecture, I, I uh, that's the first time I haven't been able to think clearly. One time I did have a little bit of a brain fog where I, I had a really hard time because I was really nervous about this lecture. It was years ago. So, you know, I have, you know, those kind of thoughts in your head. If I had that, then I would have showed up here today really anxious. And my behavior may have been that I didn't give this good a lecture or that I felt, you know, badly about myself or Maybe I wouldn't even show up. Who knows what would have happened? So you see how it's all connected? Your thoughts create your emotions, create your behavior. <clears throat> so I've been talking a little bit about these automatic thoughts. So what are automatic thoughts? Um, they're thoughts that just come in our head. Like I said earlier, sometimes we don't even notice that we're having them and we just kind of walking around throughout the day feeling a little bit unsettled. So what are some automatic thoughts that you guys may have noticed that you have that you are willing to share? <laughs> You're not going to handle it well. Very common, very common thought. Yes. Where's my phone? <laughs> <laughs> that makes you feel anxious, doesn't it? Where's my phone? <laughs> You'd say that yourself, you have a lack of focus. Uh-huh. That's something I, because I, I am a little distractible. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, you started to do something and you went all the way off on another different thing. Right. Right. Yeah, I think, I think we don't, we don't, you know, like some of you are sitting, I don't know what my automatic thoughts are because we don't, they're automatic thoughts, right? So we don't know all our automatic thoughts. Where do these thoughts come from? Which is what you were asking. Where do these things come from? Our life experiences, right? We all have life experiences. We've had times when we drove here and had, you know, very bad traffic and had a lot of road construction. And so maybe just getting in the car to drive here, we're having automatic thoughts without even realizing that this is gonna be stressful. Something bad may happen. Um, we have life experience from childhood that we have been saying for years to ourselves and created a habit of saying that. We also get our automatic thoughts from what's been modeled for us by our parents when we, or, or family, uh, close family members or, you know, friends, we see how they respond to stress 
And we think, especially when we're young, we think, oh, that's how we're supposed to respond to stress. We're supposed to get angry and yell when things get overwhelming because that helps. I saw my parents. That's how they got through it. I guess that's the way you get through it. <clears throat> so a lot of that is there. It's modeled for us. And we just kind of take it on without realizing it. What we've been told about ourselves, right? Oh, you're distractible. You know, you're distractible. You're not going to have a hard time doing that. You're not able to do that. Or you're not as smart. Or I know a thought that's an automatic thought always. And it is partially true. But you know, every time I see something that has some sort of math that's required for it, I think I can't, I can, I'm not going to understand this. I'm not going to understand this because it's got math involved. <laughs> huh? You're right. And so do you, you relax immediately too. Yeah. So, yeah. So we have, um, and you know, I was told when I was younger when that I was not, you know, very good at math. So, um, and the, the final thing I want to say about our thoughts is our brain is programmed to be on the out, on the lookout for danger. So a lot of our thoughts are just protective. You know, watch out, watch out, be vigilant. So a lot of the things that we notice and that we say to ourselves are negative because our brain is trying to protect us. So, you know, you better be careful driving there. You better be careful, you know, jumping off into the pool. Um, you know, watch out, watch out, trying to take care of us. But we can't believe everything we think. We cannot believe everything we think because a lot of those automatic th thoughts are old patterns of behavior. Some of them came from, you know, modeling our parents. They're not true anymore. Maybe they were true in one situation, but they're not true now and they're not helpful for what we're currently trying to do. So learn to recognize how your brain tries to trick you into believing things that aren't true. You really have to confront some of those thoughts and say to yourself, what is true and helpful? What is really true and helpful for me right now? Look for evidence to the contrary to develop more realistic beliefs about yourself and situations that you may encounter. Because otherwise, you're ending up with a, a lot of anxiety. And as you're going to uh, see in some of the slides I'm going to talk about next, just running around worrying is not helpful. So these are some of the, what we call cognitive distortions or just ways that we think that are not helpful. Cognitive distortions are thinking patterns that are not necessarily realistic. They're not completely true. And many times they're not logical. They're just old patterns, ways that we've learned but they become the go-to in your brain when you're in certain situations. You just automatically go to that. That's that. Oh, that's how I deal with this. This is how I think about this because this is what I've done for 20, 30 years. So the very start of, of relieving some anxiety is to challenge the thoughts that perpetuate the anxiety. Because remember the triangle? Thoughts, emotions, behavior, right? So you've got to interrupt that cycle. Change your thoughts, changes how you feel, that changes how you behave. If you want your behavior to change, you need to change your thoughts to something that's more true and reasonable. So these are some, I'm not gonna go through all these cognitive common distortions, um, but some of these um, we do a lot. Mind reading is a big one. When we're, when we're dealing with a situation, uh, talking to a person, it's a stressful situation, we just assume that they're thinking the way that we're thinking, right? That's a big assumption. So. One of the thoughts you may have is, oh, I'm gonna see how they're really feeling about this. I'm gonna check it out. I'm gonna confirm how the other person's really feeling. Negative focus, as I said earlier, the brain really is programmed to notice dangers and negative things. And so our brain is kind of programmed to have a negative focus. And so our brain many times only notices the negative aspects of a situation rather than the positive. Yeah, I think that's probably sometimes the trauma so that the experience of trauma traumatic events becomes one of those things that 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 bec
in that situation. It's just that feeling of danger, danger, danger. Yeah. Um, catastrophizing, when you expect the worst case scenario to happen to you, that's another thing where we're looking for, for danger. Um, personalization is a big one. That's when we uh, you feel personally responsible or guilty for things that you can't control. That's a big one with family members and with kids, yes? Mm -hmm. And especially if we have, ch as children, have been made to feel that we're responsible for other people's well-being or their feelings. If we've been in a family where we've had family members who are acting out and then we as children become responsible, almost we end up being the parent of, in a little way, of, of our parents. And so we take things, we feel that we're responsible, that we can control everything. And we grow up and we still try to control everything. Can we control most things? No, no, we can control a little bit about ourselves. We can control, and we're trying to learn today how we can control some of our thinking, but it's, it's very hard to control other people. And that is extremely anxiety producing to run around thinking that we're responsible for other people's happiness, or well-being, um, and that we can control that. Huge one. Gets us in a lot of trouble. To most people. Yeah, not just, not to most people. Um, oh, there's another one, when, the, just world thinking. When you assume that everything in the world will be balanced fairly. <laughs> oh, man. Why can that not be? But it's not, life is not fair, right? And I, I, kids have a hard time with this one. If you can teach your kids to plant a little seed for that, that helps relieve some anxiety because we believe that it should be fair and it creates anxiety when it's not. But life is, you know, put that in your head. Life is not fair. Okay, so cognitive restructuring. Structuring. There is always more than one story to tell about what is happening always more than one story to tell. Our thoughts create our behavior. Work on finding a story that has some truth, power, and hope. If we listen to the wrong voice, we make the wrong choice, right? So I'll tell you just a quick little story <clears throat> that I heard on NPR. And uh, it was this uh, man that had gone for a hike, this hike, and as he hiked up to the top of the mountain, he was getting more and more annoyed because he was noticing that the trail was uh, narrow in some places. And then he noticed that um, there was dirt in one area that made it hard to see the trail. And, you know, he, and then he came to a, a creek and it wasn't looking across the creek. He could see that he couldn't tell if he should go here or there. So by the time he got to the top of the trail, he was kind of annoyed with the whole hike, right? And um, and and so he ran into this um, park ranger and the park ranger said to him, you know, how was, how'd you enjoy your hike today? And he said, not really. He said, you know, the trail was kind of a mess and, and I was having a hard time. And the park ranger said, really? He said, you know, we just spent um, about two weeks working on that trail. And he said, you know, there were trees across the trail and we cleared all those out and we cut back the brush. So now there's wild, you can see all the wildflowers along the trail. And uh, we made it so that when you cross the, the creek, um, there were two, two different ways that you could go so people didn't get lost. And, um, and he, you know, he mentioned a few other beautiful things about the trail. And so the guy thought, oh, really? Okay, so then when we back, back down the trail, he noticed the wildflowers and he was happy crossing the creek. And, you know, he had a whole new story about the same trail. He was on the same trail, but he changed his thoughts, right? He changed his story. So it's powerful. And the other story is always there. Other stories always there, even in very, very stressful situations. So a biggie is worrying. How many of you believe that worrying is helpful to you? And why do we do that? We just we love indulging. In it. We love indulging in it. If sometimes when we think, when my son was was struggling in college and you know dropped out and then went back and then dropped out and didn't tell me and then was you know having a really hard time. 
I just worried all the time. You know, I just worry, worry, worry. And it didn't, it doesn't help. And I, so I, when I was preparing for this lecture, I thought, I'm going to look it up. I'm going to see if worrying, if they studied it, and they have studied it. And worrying does not help. It makes it, it does make it worse. There's studies on this. So we believe we have a thought. We wouldn't worry if we, if we didn't have a thought about it. So we believe that it's at least something we can do, right? A belief that if we think hard and long enough, overthinking was what that is, we can control the situation, right? That's why we worry. We do think, we do have a thought that it's helpful. In fact, worrying does not help us problem solve. And there's a difference between worrying and problem solving. Worrying keeps us in the future. When we're in the future, it distances us from dealing with the current situation. So it really, it makes it worse for us. And there are studies that showed that worrying is a defensive tool that keeps us from having to deal with our hard emotions. So my real hard emotion with my son was that I was sad, you know, about it. And I wasn't dealing with that at all. I would, that worrying kept me completely away from that it was a good defense. And worrying keeps us from having to deal head on with uncertainty. And that's the big one. We do not want things to be uncertain. We do not want to deal with that. We don't know how to deal with that. And we think worrying is going to help us with that. So there's a difference between worrying and problem solving. Worrying, we focus on things that can go wrong, use a lot of negative thinking, right? Focus is on the threat. We ruminate, which when we ruminate, it causes us to have a narrow view of the problem. We can't see the other story at all. There's another story, two or three stories there. We can't see them when we're ruminating because rumination causes us to narrowly focus on them, something. We may, it may cause us to focus on our responsibility for a bad situation, our, our lack of ability to solve the problem. That's what I was doing with my son. I felt all responsible for that. Um, and I, I was focused on my lack of ability. I tried this, I tried that, blah, blah, blah. I felt bad about myself. Worrying ends up making us feel badly about ourselves. It negatively influences our judgment and our decision-making. So when we're in that worried state, we're less likely to be able to really help ourselves or other people. It takes us away from goal-directed thinking. And it distances from our true feelings and our ability to use emotion-focused coping, which I'm going to talk about in the next slide. But problem solving is different. It's holding a positive stance toward a problem, involves clearly pinpointing a problem, being able to see the different aspects, determining what you hope to achieve. And you also develop an ability to determine what you can control and what you can't. When you're problem solving and discussing it with people, you get the whole picture rather than this little narrow view. It helps you come up with a range of solutions, helps you identify optimal solutions, and allows you to use emotion-focused cope. What do you think about that? It's hard. Worrying is a habit, but it's a habit to... It's a hard habit, but it's a habit to try to be aware of and to try to let go of. I, throw, I want to throw in, you guys remember Trevor's Joshua did talk with us. If it's okay to throw this in or yeah. not. One of his concepts was acknowledging that you're going to worry, but basically schedule it. <laughs> oh, yeah, there is a worrying, yeah. You know, so I, 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 I can't worry about whatever this, I can't worry about Noah right now, but I'll let myself worry tonight at eight o'clock. Right. Everything is done for the day. And I'll worry and setting a timer, I'll worry for 30 <laughs> minutes and I'll allow myself just to worry. Yeah. yeah, that's a good one. That's a good, good technique. Yeah. And or, or I'm going to journal, I'm going to worry, I'm going to journal about this for 20 minutes. I'm going to journal about all my worries for 20 minutes. So emotion, emotion focused coping involves managing your, your emotional response to a situation instead of trying to solve the problem itself. Many times we can't solve the problem, can we, right? So we've got that situation on that triangle, that situation, say, you know, our son's not doing well in college and we can't solve that. We've tried problem solving, we've done different things, but the problem's still there, we can't solve it. But what we can work on is our emotional response to it, right? That's what we can work on. The external stressor doesn't change. The impact of the emotions you feel does. So that we're not, gonna walk, not walking around being anxious all the time. This is also called emotional regulation. Have you heard of that? It's a big, it's a big term now, learning how to emotionally regulate. 
it's probably the, one of the most important things we can teach our children is how to manage their emotions. When you get angry, do you throw things or do you manage your emotions? Do you be aware of your emotions and work through them? It works as this works, this works in all sorts of situations, but works especially well in situations where a stressor cannot be changed, which is a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the tools that we use to strengthen our emotion focus coping are acceptance, accepting the situation, journaling, mindfulness meditation, forgiveness of yourself or for other people, and then reframing your cognitive distortions, which is kind of what we're spending a lot of time talking about today. So let's practice a little bit about this. Um, I, let's just take uh, five minutes. You guys have a sheet there. Um, does everybody not have a worksheet? Does somebody not have a worksheet? You don't have a worksheet. Oh, there's one right there, yeah. Thank you. Yes, we do. Does anybody not have a pen? I just encourage you to just kind of do this little worksheet on the on the back. Just take just do this quickly. Don't spend too much time on it, and then we're gonna kind of go through it. I've written it out here. You can just on your own, think of a recent situation that led to a negative emotion. Um, write down your unhelpful thoughts that you had about the situation. Think about how those thoughts make you feel. And then what were the behaviors that you did because of the thoughts that you were having? Anybody need any help? Is it understandable? Okay. Anybody at home need any help? Of course, the important part of this is noticing what's the other story. What are what is a thought or thoughts that are more true, helpful, and hopeful? That's the important part of this.
There's always another story. It's always there. Silver linings, right? Silver linings. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> remember back you know if you're in the situation it's a lot easier to do this but hard to remember back oh good yeah <laughs> yeah A lot of things to contribute to your thoughts, automatic thoughts. Yeah. Okay, we're just going to take another minute and then we're going to talk. Okay, let's all kind of come back together and talk about this. Does, uh, does anybody have a, a, a thought or situation that they want to share? Nobody has to share theirs because I have situations that I can share to kind of go through this. But if somebody has one they want to share, go ahead, raise your hand. Yeah, Freddie. Mine was about overeating and going to the refrigerator to try to fill the feelings that discontent with food uh -huh. and realizing when it work. So your thoughts, so wait, so what was the situation? Uh, the situation was I was mad at myself. And I uh -huh. the refrigerator to see if I could find food. So, so you were, I'm just for the people at home. So you were mad at yourself about something that happened in your life. And so then your thought was? I'm going to eat my I'm going to eat and I'll feel better. Yes. And then having that thought caused what behavior? To walk up to the refrigerator and start eating anything, everything. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Good. So good example and uh, not an uncommon behavior for people. I'll just say that to you. Thank you for sharing that. So what, what, so Let's say that situation happens, you know, this afternoon, you have a, something in your life that makes you feel upset and you have that thought that goes in your head that says, I'm going to eat, I'm going to go eat because that's going to make me feel better. What can you substitute for that thought? Well, thought that's true. That too, I could be nicer and kinder to myself and really ask myself, am I really that hungry? Yeah. Do I really want or think that that? food that I'm choosing is going to feel that I'm really mad. Right. <laughs> and if I really go in that direction, more likely than not, say no, because I'm going to Yeah, yeah, yeah. And maybe my choice will be a little healthier. Yes. Than a bread on the Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> so your thought is really, you know, caretaking of yourself. I, I need to take care of myself. Just even thinking that thought and saying it out loud is a little relaxing, isn't it? compared to the other thought yeah 
thank you for sharing that good example. So are her thought, you know, her thoughts change her behavior, right? Right. Anybody else have anything? Sure. Was that helpful for you to, to do that exercise? Yeah. So a big part of this is what Freddie just talked about, compassionate, truthful self-talk. Most of us have a running commentary in our head throughout the day that we're usually unaware of. And because of that commentary that we're having, we can just end up having a low level of feeling kind of unsettled, worried, distracted, maybe sad, maybe tired, fatigued, because, our, because of this negative kind of untrue self-talk that's just rattling throughout the day. You know, So the first step in this is to become aware, and that's the hardest part because we're just in the habit of, of not being aware of it. So step one is being aware of how you are talking to yourself throughout the day. Some different ways that you can increase your awareness of how you're talking to yourself is to be able to stop yourself in the middle of the day to check in. Because otherwise we just get on the slide at the beginning of the day and the end of the day we sh shot off into our beds, right? We don't even know what we thought about all day. So set an alarm on your watch or your phone now. I did this the other day. You can set it to go off at, you know, 9 a.m., 2 p.m., 6 p.m. When the little alarm goes off, check in and ask yourself how you're feeling. Ask yourself, what thoughts am I having right now? So like right now, just everybody just, no, say it aloud, but just check in. What thoughts are you having right now? And how are you feeling? And if you start doing this, if you, you if you start doing that throughout the day, you'll get more in the habit of checking in with yourself. That will become a new habit. Right now, we're not in the habit of doing that. If you don't have a watch or um, a, a smartphone that you can set an alarm on, another thing that works is post-it notes. You can stick them different places. Stick one on the dashboard of your car and stick one on your bathroom mirror. Stick one on the refrigerator. You know, stick them different places. Maybe one, uh, you know, on your purse one on your wallet. Um, and it doesn't have to say, you know, anything like what's your self-talk. It could just be you know, a check mark, right? Just remind you to check in. So nobody has to know that you're doing all this. It could be a private thing. So notice the negative chatter. And when you notice it, ask yourself, what is more truthful, compassionate, and realistic? That's all. There's another story. There's always another story. So if you checked in just now and you noticed you were having some anxious thoughts or negative thoughts, yes, that may be part of the story. But what's what's another part of the story that's more truthful and helpful and hopeful? So besides, we talked a lot about, about cognitive um, thoughts and cognitive distortions and changing those. Another tool to manage anxiety that works for a lot of people is mindfulness tools. And there's all sorts of mindfulness tools. There's, you know, meditation, there's working on puzzles, there's uh, listening to music. Mindfulness is the awareness that arises through paying attention to something on purpose in the present moment, non-judgmentally. The non-judgmentally is an important part because if we judge what we're doing or what we're thinking about, that can create more anxiety. So it's just being in the moment basically with something and just being with whatever is. Mindfulness gives us an opportunity to practice not over-engaging in one's distressing thoughts and emotions. So it's really a practice of real of seeing that I can be having all these thoughts going on and I can sit and focus on my breathing or whatever it is, the one thing that you're putting your attention to. And it will, I will, I will just notice the thoughts as they go by, but I'm able to get back to myself and my center. And then you'll get pulled away again many times, but that's kind of irrelevant. The practice and the healing, and this is by Sharon Salzberg, who's uh, somebody who teaches meditation. The healing is in the return. It's not in getting, not in getting lost. So never worry if you're meditating and you're trying and you're focusing on your breathing that you got pulled away 20 times in two minutes. It's the return is the practice. The return is what you're learning is that you can have all this negative thoughts, you can have negative things happening in your life 
And you can have them there, but you can be centered and not get pulled into the anxiety all the time. Get pulled into your anchor, into yourself. Meditation can help you separate yourself from your thoughts as you react to stress. It's a little separation of thoughts. It's not that you're trying to say, I'm not having those thoughts. You can notice those thoughts. They can be there floating along, but you're coming back into yourself. So we'll practice a little meditation that I like to do. You don't even have to close your eyes for this one. It's called the three by three by three technique. It is a meditation and it can be used to, especially if you're in a situation where you're feeling very anxious and very stressed, it grounds you in the present moment. It brings you back to your center or your anchor. So there's how, here's how you do it. So we're going to go through this right now. So right now, just kind of get yourself centered, you know, feet on the ground, keep your eyes open. And I want you to name three things that you see. Take a moment to really observe these objects. Note their details, colors, and shapes. And this process will help you shift your focus from your internal anxiety to the external environment. So everybody notice three things. Notice some characteristics about them. Okay, while you were doing that, were you able to think about other things? And if you were, you just bring yourself back. Oh, what, what, I, I forgot, I didn't do the third thing. You just bring yourself back to it. It doesn't matter that you got pulled away after the first one. Okay, now identify three things that you hear. Find three sounds you can hear. It could be something quiet, it could be something loud. And just notice the characteristics of those sounds. Really focus on the sounds. Okay, how is that? <laughs> huh? Yeah, yeah. good. Focusing. Yeah, yeah, it does take you away. Focusing takes you away, yeah. Now move three parts of your body. It could be as simple as rolling your shoulders, wiggling your toes, and pay attention to the sensations caused by each movement. That feels good, huh? <laughs> I, did a little, I did a little stretching. I like it was easy to pay attention to that. All right. This is something you can do pretty much anywhere, anytime. How did that feel? And it's a practice. The more that you do that, the more that you come to believe that you're able to have other you know, thoughts and anxieties going on, but you're able to be, be centered in the midst of that. It's just a practice, just like you practice trying to throw a basketball into a hoop. It's the same thing. You're just practicing it until you, it becomes a habit. And this next one I want to do, it's called the loving kindness meditation. And this is actually what I ended up doing when I was uh, worried about my son when he was in college. Yes. Yes. Suddenly, yeah. Yes. What do you think that thing is? <laughs> if we have an audience for something, when you're just by yourself, likely you're just focusing on the basket, right? You're in the moment with that. We have an audience. We're thinking about, oh, I wonder what those, what's going to happen if those people see me miss the basket. I wonder if they're going to think I'm like a loser. I wonder, I wonder what if, what if, what if. So an audience causes us to, it's harder. It pulls us out of our centeredness and out into the external world. Yeah. But we get better. The, the point of that story was that if we practice something, we get, we're able to get better at it and it becomes more of just a habit. 
you need to practice with them you might if you're if you're planning on if you if your goal is to be good at throwing a basketball in front of people then yes you'd want to practice in front of people so that you learn how to how to have different thoughts in your head i can i can throw this i'm here i'm present i'm looking at the basketball rim you know i'm focused on that good question so this loving kindness meditation was very helpful for me when I was dealing with my my anxiety over my son because I, I got to a point where there's really nothing else that I could do but then I was still just worrying and so I learned about this loving kindness meditation and it's very simple and it's a good thing to do when you feel like you can't control something and there's really nothing that you can do um, so let's just try this now and we're gonna we start out just by saying this meta meditation to yourself but also have in mind that somebody in your life that you would like to send peace and happiness to so have that in your head before we start okay so just go ahead and get in a comfortable position um i like to do it with my eyes closed but it's up to you um whatever's comfortable for you and go ahead and just take a deep breath in through your mouth or your nose, whatever's comfortable. Notice it in your chest and then just relax and let the air out. And then just take one more relaxed breath on your own. Notice the breath in and out. And now I want you to picture yourself in your mind's eye. And you're sitting in a place where there's warmth and light, and you're surrounded by light and warm energy. And say to yourself, may I be happy. May I be healthy. May I be free of suffering. May I live in peace. May my life be blessed with ease. And now think of someone that you care about that you would like to send a meta meditation to and picture that person in your mind's eye once again with light and warmth surrounding them and say to them, may you be happy. May you be healthy. May you be free of suffering. May you live in peace. May your life be blessed with ease. And just go ahead and come back into the room, open your eyes. It's a nice thing. It's almost like doing a prayer for somebody. Um, it's a nice thing to do when you want to do something. <laughs> How did that feel to you? Is it helpful at all? Hmm? More than one. Yes, you can do more than one. And then you can go on with this and just open it up to the world, basically. But we just did these two today. Yes. Yes. It's a wonderful thing to do in the morning for yourself or at bedtime before you go to sleep. And once again, that feeling or the ability to just kind of go in and do that for yourself and for other people, the more you do it, the more it can become a habit. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this slide, but the whole idea of all this is that we wanna create new habits. And when we create new habits, we create new neural pathways in our brain. So then when we get in a situation where we typically would feel anxious and have anxious thoughts and start worrying and ruminating and all those things, we more naturally go to 
a automatic, hopeful, strong, positive thought, or we more automatically go to be able to anchor ourselves and think self-acceptance and loving thoughts to ourselves. Because we've created a new habit, we've got a new pathway in our brain. If you want to learn more about this whole habit creating and neural pathways, there's a whole lecture that I gave on it a couple months ago. It's I think it's called Creating New Habits. It's on the, the uh, Cardiovascular Wellness Program site on YouTube. There's also a mindfulness practice class here in the Cardiovascular Wellness Program. Linda Larson teaches it once a month. It's offered in person and on Zoom. And the next class is September 26th at 1145. These are some references for the things that I've talked about. There's different uh, types of meditation, um, different types of workbooks. And also on here, the one, the second from the bottom is uh, Linda Larson's site. She's got a whole bunch of meditations on that site that are, that you can use body scans, all sorts of things, information. It's a great site. And the last one on there is a, Anxiety and Worry Workbook by Aaron Beck that I talked about that's great for kind of just working through on your own, uh, reinforces all the things we talked about today. Is it a company? Or a company? It's, it's actually a, it's got, it's kind of a combination of textbook and workbook. It's, it's a combination. Oh, but it's not two separate? No. Oh. He does have some that are just books. Any questions or comments? Did everybody get one little seed today? Good. <laughs> All right. Yeah.